Welcome back to book club. Long time no talk. I'm very, very excited for a lot of reasons. I think this might be the most special book club that we've had yet um, because we have a very, very, very special guest. Hi, John Gray. <laughs> um, we have a very, very, very special guest, Miss Jane Fonda, who I am a massive fan of for so many different reasons. I cannot believe that she has agreed to come on here to my little tiny book club um, because she is just such a legend for so many reasons, including all of her work in activism from way before activism was cool and trendy. Uh, she was down in the trenches with people fighting for different social justice issues and um, I just really admire her for so many reasons and I took notes because I really want to get this right because Jane's story is just so incredible and I'm going to bring her on here to talk about it herself but um, I wanted to give a little like background before I bring her on here. So first I want to talk about how she kind of started. Jane moved back to the States from France in 1961 at the start of the Vietnam War um, to get involved in civil rights demonstrations and the movement to end the war. She played a really big role in that. Um, she was really involved in the Black Panthers and the civil rights movement. She supported the Black Panthers by throwing um, fundraisers in her home, like a legend. <laughs> and she campaigned on behalf of Angela Davis and other revolutionaries. Um, and then also she was very known for her work in ending the Vietnam War and that movement. She toured North Vietnam where she spoke out against uh, military policy in the country and met prisoners of war, led protests, spoke out against Nixon, things that were not necessarily safe at the time, but she risked you know, her job, her life, her reputation for these causes that didn't have people like her with a platform like hers to um to speak on them so i think that that her advocacy and really i think jane is the definition of an advocate um and such a great role model you know she's spoke out um in support of native americans women's rights the list goes on and on and by 1970 jane had been arrested um and that's well she was arrested on on suspicion of drug trafficking on her way back from Canada where she was doing an anti-war speaking tour. Uh, and that's where she got that iconic mugshot that you've all seen, I'm sure of her holding her fist up, which I love. I look at that for inspiration all the time. Um, and without further ado, I am going to invite Miss Fonda on here herself. And her book title is What Can I Do, um, written by Jane herself. Um, let me invite her on here. I also learned so much from reading her book. Um, I like to think I'm from a generation that knows a lot and is very aware. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. I'm honestly, it took me so long to learn how to do this, and I'm very, very impressed with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that you're blushing, Kaya. That's so sweet. No, I'm a complete, I don't know how to do it, but my assistant made, made this all work. So hi, thank you for having me on. Thank you for coming on here. Really, when I say you are the guest that I've been the most excited about, I just can't oh. believe you're on here, and I'm so, so happy to have you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much. And um, congratulations on your new book. It is wonderful. I was saying, I, I th like to think, there it is. <laughs> um, I like to think I'm from a generation that knows so much about the climate crisis mm -hmm. and you taught me so much from reading that. So it turns out that there's always more to be learned. So I wanted to start with asking how you got involved with activism. Well, as you said in your introduction, it was the, the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. um, for, for a long time, I really believe my father fought in the Second World War and I was somebody that really thought that if our soldiers were fighting someplace, mm -hmm. we were on the side of the angels. It couldn't be wrong. Mm -hmm. But as you noted in your introduction, you know, I was married and living in France and a lot of American soldiers who were deserting from Vietnam came to Paris mm -hmm. and searching out compatriots to help them. Um, and I 
spent time talking to those soldiers and they opened my eyes to what was really happening in Vietnam. And that, and I totally, I read a book, they gave me a book to read. First, I didn't believe them. And then they gave me a book to read and books have always been my catalyst. And um, I left my husband, I left France, I'm back here and devoted myself to trying to end the war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I also saw that you worked a lot with the Black Panthers and Huey Newton um, in the early 1970s. I wanted to ask, you know, before getting into your book, sort of how you felt seeing this fire be reignited over the last two years with BLM and the movement and sort of how you, you saw this resurgence of fire. I can't tell you how happy it made me, Kaya. Mm -hmm. you know, I will have to say that I never agreed with the, the Black Panthers strategy of armed revolution. Mm -hmm. I, I worked with them because there was so much police, amazing police violence, mm -hmm. but just horrible things were being done. And a lot of people who were truly political prisoners were being put in jail. And so I raised money to get them out. Yeah. Today, mm -hmm. we have Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. and it is a whole different, thing yes um there's first of all i think it the the difference is a lot of it is that it's led by women mm -hmm. i mean in fact with the panthers women were the strategists they did all the work in many ways they have kept a lot of the panther programs going the, the free breakfast in the schools and all that um but they never got the credit it was always the men out front black lives matter is women founded Mm -hmm. um, uh, women's ideas, women's joy. You know, one I didn't even realize it until I started getting these emails that had flyers about self-care, why it's important for activists to take care of their health and their mental health. Mm. And I thought, whoa, I've never gotten that from a, any movement. And then I thought, this must be run by women. And I found out that it was. <laughs> you know, that... <laughs> caring for each other as we fight the fight. Mm -hmm. That's something that only a woman w would think of. So I, I'm friends with the founders of it, especially Patrice mm -hmm. Colors. When I saw the outpouring that happened after the murder of George Floyd mm -hmm. start like wildfire all the way across the country and in places in California, communities that are all white, people mm -hmm. were out there with signs Black Lives Matter, and it just, it made me very happy. I think this has been a, an inflection point in American history. And I hope and pray and believe that we won't go back, that it will be a forward movement that will happen. Absolutely. And I also think with, with social and racial issues, it can be hard to know where to start and, and to even think that there can be anything that will help when it seems like such a big cause and the same for environmental justice. So how did you sort of narrow your focus um, to, to make sure it was effective? I've been an environmentalist. I mean, I think we all are. We love animals, we love plants, we love species in our hearts, we care. And I've always been an environmentalist. But when I realized because of what the scientists were saying, mm -hmm. and I must say Greta Thunberg had a huge impact on me. Yeah, on all of us. Um, and the young client in, in 2019, the, the, the largest protest in the world that ever happened, it was all young people, young students. Mm -hmm. um, it got me to focus a lot more on, on the, the specifics of the climate crisis and what the scientists were saying. And it was very clear, we have to cut our fossil fuel emissions in half by, by 2030. Mm -hmm. That's less than a decade from now. And when I read that, I thought, holy cow, I have to do more. I'm, I have a platform. I'm, I'm a celebrity. I am going to put my body on the line. And that's when I called my friend Annie Leonard, who runs Greenpeace. <laughs> because, you know, it's one thing for an individual, no matter how famous you are, to do something. You have to be part of an organization. Yes. Organization is what matters, especially when time is against you. So I, working with Greenpeace, um, we developed this idea for Fire Drill Fridays every Friday. And it's basically borrowed from what happened back in the 80s to stop apartheid in South Africa. Oh, wow. Civil 
disobedience. When you've protested and marched and written and lobbied for 40 years, we've been doing this and we haven't been properly listened to, the next thing you do is civil disobedience. And what does that mean? It means, it means that you, you do something that is illegal, like for me, standing on the steps of the Capitol, holding a sign and chanting. That's illegal. So we were arrested. Mm -hmm. And because I'm old and because I'm famous, mm -hmm. um, it got a lot of attention. And I kept doing it over and over and over. And the crowds in D.C. where we did this got bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, mm -hmm. hundreds of people began to come and get arrested. And many of them were celebrities. So that, you know, that really helped draw attention to it. Yeah. Um, his, I mean, in American history, so, civil disobedience is what has changed history. All the way back to the Boston Tea Party to those lunch counter sit-ins, the Montgomery boycott. You know, it's when, when, when large numbers of people put their bodies on the line, non-violently, this is what's important. This is the mistake the Panthers made. When you begin to grow a movement, you have to be non-violent. That's when people will, will join you and you get trained how to do it, okay? So that's, that's what moved me from being uh, whenever there's a protest, I'm going to go to, I'm going to create a part, a movement that's part of Greenpeace, that's part of the climate movement, mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm going to bring in more people. I mean, all the young people like you and Greta were saying, where are the old people? We didn't create this problem. Right. Come on, come on, you elders. So I thought, well, okay, I'm going to join. And we've kept doing it even during COVID. We do it, you know, virtually online. Oh, wow. And and, um, you know, I view it like that. You know what Rus Russian nesting dolls are? I do. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's one doll inside of another doll. Yeah. So there's the, le the outer doll. That's the climate crisis. Inside it is racism. That's another doll. Uh, misogyny. That's another doll. Um, Anti-democracy. That's another doll. Economic inequality. All the other issues are inside of the climate crisis. And the climate crisis wouldn't exist if it weren't for racism and patriarchy and misogyny. It's a mindset mm -hmm. that allows the fossil fuel industry and the people that they buy off to look at the Amazon and think, that would be good flooring, or that would make a nice door. Mm -hmm. that beautiful sequoia tree, or let me just cut it all down so I can grow soy and corn for cattle. You know, it's a certain kind of mindset that sees people as part of a hierarchy, white men, you know, then white women and then black. And then, you know, instead of we're all equal, mm -hmm. we're viewed, we're viewed as commodities as part of a hierarchy. It, it's a mindset that affects all the other parts of our lives. Mm -hmm. And that's why, for example, during all the Black Lives Matter uprisings after George Floyd, it was very easy to have some of those leaders from Black Lives Matter come on to, 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 to Fire Drill Friday to mm -hmm. talk about the intersections between the things. Yeah, absolutely. And I loved, I mean, I was so, interested in the fact you say in your book about that women are disproportionately affected by the climate. Yeah. Well, it's easy to understand. I mean, it's, it's especially easy to understand if you go to the global South, Africa, India, China, mm -hmm. places where women are treated like, like chattel. Women, women mm -hmm. do all the harvesting and the planting and the, the bringing water and the bringing wood and they do all the cooking and women are kind of are responsible for the survival of the family. So when there's a drought or a hurricane or a flood or whatever, women's work becomes so much harder. They can't find the water, they can't find the wood and so forth. And their 80% of climate refugees are women and we're the last to be rescued and children, of course, our children are very, very vulnerable to air pollution. I mean, millions of children die every year because of fossil fuel emissions. So, yes, we, we bear the brunt of the climate crisis, but we're also in the leadership of the climate solutions. Mm -hmm. Because of you? <laughs> oh, because of young people. Oh. <laughs> young people, because, you know, it's, it's your future. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's shocking to me. And I think like I, I grew up in Malibu and the elementary school that I went to was a marine science school. And so from the time I was a baby, I was made very, very aware of the climate crisis and what was going on. And it seemed like a no brainer to me. And then, you know, meeting new people and, and being more cultured. And then you realize that it really doesn't feel so urgent to a lot of people. And it was shocking to me. I'm like, our world is, none of these issues that we all talk about are going to matter if the world if none of us are alive to even, you know, fight for them. And, um, and I also, I just wanted to ask how you handle and sort of conversate with uh, people who don't believe in first reaction, complete disbelief that anyone could deny what was happening. Right. Well, the good news is that there has been a huge increase in the number of Americans who understand that there is a climate crisis, mm -hmm. especially in the last year. I mean, it's hard to avoid, right? Texas is freezing, you know, froze over, the ocean is burning, the fires in California, the floods in the East. I mean, it's, you know, the fact is what we need to persuade people of is not so much that there is a climate crisis, because most people know that, enough people to matter know that. <laughs> what we have to, to convince people of is the urgency. We don't have much time. You know, there's the, the, the warming continues. And at a certain point, because of the warming, whole ecosystems collapse. I mean, just think what happens when the ocean collapses? The ocean provides over 50% of the oxygen that we breathe. Um, what happens when the Atlantic current, which controls climate, gets thrown off course? You know, then it becomes catastrophe and it's out of our control. What we have to try to do is stop the warming while we still can before it's out of our control. We have nine years to do that in, nine years to cut fossil fuel use in half. We can have all the windmills and the solar panels, everything. But if they keep drilling and burning fossil fuels, we, we're not gonna make it. So convincing people of the urgency yes. that the focus has to be on stopping fossil fuels Right now, for example, for your listeners, what you can do is call your elected officials and tell them to n not support fossil fuel subsidies. Dollars paying fossil, billions of dollars to fossil fuels in the form of subsidies. These people are killing us and we're paying them to do it. We have to stop fossil fuel subsidies. So that's the kind of talking we have to do. But it's all in my book, actually. Mm -hmm. My book is nothing but just like how to. I know, and very about it, but you, you talked about the issue, but you also gave such concrete things to do because it's not unachievable, you know, it's not out of reach. I loved reading your book that I, I was writing things down, like, I can do this, this, and this. And if, if you had to give people like three places to start young people who are like, I really, really want to make a difference, what would you tell them to do? Um, I would tell them to join an organization like Sunrise Movement, mm -hmm. um, Extinction Rebellion. I mean, Sunrise Movement is the most amazing organization of young people. Mm. It's beautifully strategic. It's very smart. It's very huge. Mm -hmm. Retta's organization is called Fridays for Future. Mm -hmm. There's also Extinction Rebellion. Find out an organization, Google. But Google Sunrise, I would say, and um, join an organization and, and follow an organization because they will constantly keep you updated on what's happening, what <laughs> actions there are that you can take. That's my advice. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and what are, I mean, with social media and everything, because you've been doing this a very long time since before social media, since before, you know, you could go on a live stream and talk about yes. What positive or even negative effects do you feel like social media has had on, you know, a movement like the climate crisis? It's a lot easier to organize a rally, yeah. demonstration, a protest. You know, it would have been much harder pre-social media knowing well, it probably wouldn't have happened pre-social media that the murder of George Floyd led to this to this 
contagion of, you know, the protest just metastasized all around the country. I think a lot of that has to do with social media. Mm -hmm. So I, I think in, in that sense, it's, it's, people can know things a lot faster, mm -hmm. but getting together in the flesh, there's nothing like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, I know that, that a lot of young people suffer from um, depression, from anxiety because of, of the climate crisis. The best <laughs> antidote is to get together with your peers and protest and become an activist. Mm -hmm. It's a great antidote to depression. It is. And I... I mean, I never realized that that was, it's like a happy side effect of protesting, but the feeling of unity and family that you get from being out there with people right? that are, you all about the same things, there's nothing like it. And, and it's just like a happy accident because you're all there really to, you know, fight for these social justice yeah. and, and climate. Yeah, and people think fight. activism is like, eat your broccoli, you know, or no, no it's fun. It's fun and it's Yeah, and I think, incredible and I, I famous red coat that you're wearing on the cover of your book and um how that symbol for your your movement i wanted you to talk about the significance of this red coat well we called our action fire drill fridays because of greta thunberg you know who said we have to act like our house is on fire like it's a real crisis because it is so fire drill fridays and first i thought well maybe i should wear a fireman's coat and uh, we decided, no, that was too hokey, but <laughs> that I should wear something red. So I went to Neiman's in D.C., and uh, there was one red coat left. It was on sale. So, and it fit me, so I bought it. And it's the last article of new clothing that I bought. Wow. wow. Yeah. And I, I also, you mentioned in your book sort of the contradiction that you feel sometimes being on a red carpet or doing the things... Um, you know, having like sort of a double life, you know, you'd go from that to then standing on the steps and protesting. And how have you learned how to ground yourself in those moments and get back to what really matters in a world mm -hmm. of Boston, very artificial things? Well, it's important on, you know, I'm a movie actor mm -hmm. and uh, as well as an activist, my movie acting gives, is what gives me a platform and that's good. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, I mean, it's why you do what you do, Instagram, you have a platform, mm -hmm. and a lot of followers. And, you know, doing red carpet is part of building that platform. You know, it's just part of, it's part of your responsibility as a professional person to, to do that, mm -hmm. and wear something that is bespoke, <laughs> wear something that's uh, borrowed or you know i have clothes i haven't changed size so i have clothes that i've had for decades that i can wear because <laughs> you're doing wall squats in um in the jail that's hall. right <laughs> stepping up into that police van is replaces the treadmill i can tell you <laughs> and I, I finally just want to ask why did you feel it was important to write this book now um and like like why yeah why now well, I started writing it while we were still in D.C. Mm -hmm. um, Annie Leonard, who runs D.C. USA, um, we, we, we talked about it and uh, it was, people loved Fire Drill Friday and they, and they still do. And we decided that it would be good to get the word out even wider, especially if we, if we, um, if we told people, gave them lots of things about what, what, what can you do. I mean, I was really, really depressed about the climate situation until I started it. And so I wanted to help other people get over their, you know, their concern, their anxiety, their, their depression. All the money from the book goes to uh, Greenpeace. Um, and, you know, I just, I finished it before COVID hit, so that was good. <laughs> um, I just wanted to get it out fast to try to yeah. give people the answers they wanted, you know? A lot of people, they know that it has global warming, but see what we did with Fire Drill Fridays, every week we would focus on another aspect of the effects of the climate, the ocean, the forests, women, jobs, health, all of these things are affected. And so that's what the book is. Every chapter is a different aspect of it and what you can do about that aspect of it. Well, I cannot thank you enough for 
writing this book for being the answer I think that a lot of us are searching for and just for all of the work that you do and if fire drill Fridays ever come back in person I will be the first one there I'm like such a huge fan of everything that you do and I just think you know the world really really needs people like you especially Thank you. who you know really need someone to look to and you've just been a light in all of this and I really really admire you that means a lot to me. Thank you, Kai. I appreciate it and respect what you're doing. Thank you. Bye. Bye.